Hello, welcome, and thank you. Together, we, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority and you, are building stronger communities together, one person at a time. Northeast Delta HSA is a trusted resource for credible information, evidence-based programs, and guidance. We are here adapting our services to meet community behavioral, physical, mental, and social health needs. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority is led by Dr. Montez A. Sizer, Executive Director. Collectively, we are all directed by our vision, mission, and tenets. Our vision, to build a unified Northeast Louisiana where individuals are thriving and reaching their full human potential. Our mission, to serve as a catalyst for individuals with mental health, developmental disabilities, and addictive disorders. And our tenants that guide our actions, greater access to services, excellent customer service, and quality, competent care. This webinar series by the Prevention and Wellness Team at Northeast Delta HSA is here to improve education awareness, advance community discourse, and focus on recovery during social distancing and other issues enhanced by COVID-19. Today's topic, how to save a life, opioid overdose prevention and Narcan rescue with Kara Jackson Etienne, licensed master social worker. Thank you, Alan. As stated, I am Kara Etienne, licensed master social worker and the Opioid Use Disorder Prevention Manager. Today, I will provide education on opioid prevention and Narcan education and training. As we go through this presentation, please enter any questions that you have throughout in the chat and I will answer them at the end. Let's begin. What is LASOR? The Louisiana State Opioid Response Program is designed to enhance existing statewide prevention, treatment, and recovery support services for individuals with or at risk for opioid use disorder. Opioid use disorders and opioid overdose are complex circumstances shaped by numerous social, biological, and psychological factors. The realities faced by people who use drugs may be common across regions or vary within tight social groups. It's important to know your epidemic and know your response in an effort to have a clear understanding of the causes and characteristics of local health problems. This will help to employ strategies that are effective, holistic, understanding who is at risk, how that risk is constructed, and what can be done to reduce the risk. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority Opioid Misuse and Abuse Prevention Program provides the following services. Narcan education and distribution to increase awareness and reduce the occurrence of opioid related overdoses. The terror education and dis distribution which is used to deactivate and dispose of unused or expired medications safely in your home. Grief counseling, a mobile service provided through the crisis mobile team facilitated via groups in an effort to support individuals and families that have been affected by the misuse and abuse of opioids and other substances. Peer support, a mobile support service provided through the crisis mobile team by a certified peer support specialist who served as a guide to those in recovery by using their own lived experiences and training to help discover a path of recovery. Generation RX, an evidence-based program that educates youth, college students, adults, and older adults about the potential dangers of misusing prescription medications and National Prescription Take Back Day, held every April and October nationally to bring awareness to the harmful effects and consequences of having used and or unexpired medications in the home. Twice a year, we hold a regional Take Back Day 
by partnering with local pharmacies and stores to host a day for people to bring their unused and expired drugs to a determined location. The history of opioid use in America. What is going on now with opioids isn't the first addiction epidemic the United States has had. There has been multiple addiction epidemics with different substances from alcohol to crack cocaine to opioids and heroin. The opioid crisis that exists today began in the 90s and the reasons are many. But one that stands out is when after publication of a short letter to the editor in a major medical journal declaring that those with chronic pain who received opioids rarely became addicted, prescriber attitudes towards opioid use changed. Pain began to be viewed as the fifth vital sign. Opioids were no longer reserved for treatment of acute pain or terminal pain conditions, but were used to treat any pain condition, regardless to how minor or acute. The U.S. has had multiple addiction epidemics, and the opioid epidemic is one of the worst. Let's look at the opioid epidemic by the numbers. The opioid public health emergency is nationwide and impacts health, justice, and child welfare systems at alarming rates. In the U.S., more than 130 people die every day from an opioid-related drug overdose. 10.3 million people misused prescription opioids in 2018, which is about one in every 30 people. In 2019, 15,349 deaths were attributed to overdosing on heroin. Every day, more than 1,000 people are treated in emergency departments for misusing prescription opioids. Louisiana's ranking in the epidemic. Opioid abuse is a problem in Louisiana where almost all indicators addiction to opioid medication, overdose deaths, emergency room admission, and overprescribing are evidence of the problem. Nationally, Louisiana is ranked fifth in opioid prescribing rates and 19th in overdose deaths. Now, let's take a look at what the 49% increase between 2014 and 2018 looks like. Here you see that in 2014, there were 217 reported opioid-related overdose deaths. And as we can see, each year there has been a steady increase, which has more than doubled or had more than doubled by 2018. Now let's compare Louisiana opioid-related deaths to the national rate and the states that border us. You see that Louisiana is 2.8% higher than the national rate. We are also 9% or greater when compared to Arkansas, Mississippi, and Texas. This data doesn't mean that there isn't an opioid problem in these states or nationally, but that their opioid-related overdoses are not ending in death at the rate in which they are in Louisiana which requires us to look at our practices on where we can improve, which we will discuss further in this presentation. Here, we will begin to explore the use of evidence-based prevention. SBIRT, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment is an important tool for us to use as a crisis response team. Through our numerous encounters while doing community outreach and training, SBIRT offers us a solution for each patient, meeting them where they are and accompanying them through the initial stages and thoughts of change. SBIRT is an evidence-based approach to identify patients who use alcohol and other drugs at risky levels with the goal of reducing and preventing related health consequences, disease, accidents, and injuries. SBIRT is unique in that it screens for all types of substance use, not just dependencies. 
Esper places risky substance use where it belongs in the realm of healthcare. It focuses on identifying risky substance use and is an effective tool for identifying risk levels related to substance use and for providing the appropriate intervention. Universal screening is incorporated into the normal routine in healthcare settings and identifies people with risky substance use. For those with a positive screen, further screening identifies the appropriate level of intervention that is required. Screening can be done through interview and self-reporting using validated screening tools such as the drug screening questionnaire known as DAS. Let's review the drug screening questionnaire, or DAS. It screens for all types of drug use and frequency of use, and it gives a quantitative index of the degree of consequences related to the use. DAS asks, how often have you used these drugs? Have you ever injected drugs? Have you ever been in treatment for substance abuse? 10 questions are answered either with either yes or no. No is scored as zero and yes is scored as one. A score of zero is no problems reported. One to two is low level and the suggested action is to monitor and reassess at a later date. A score of three to five is scored at a moderate level and the suggested action is further investigation and discussion with that patient. A score of six to eight is substantial level, and the suggested action is intensive assessment. Let's delve a little deeper. Let's look at a little bit more of what's going on. How, what's the frequency of use? Are you mixing it and combining it with other things? And nine to 10 is severe level with the suggested action as also intensive assessment. It typically only takes about five minutes to administer the actual DAS and can be given in either a self-report, meaning you can allow the patient to complete this questionnaire on their own, or in an interview format where you ask the question and fill out as you proceed through. The brief intervention happens if a screening indicates moderate risk. It utilizes motivational interviewing techniques that are focused on raising the awareness of the substance use and its consequences, and then motivating toward a positive behavioral change. A typical brief intervention takes from five to 15 minutes to conduct. To enhance the discussion, there should be short conversations around each of the topics with the client providing you feedback throughout. So it should not just be a one-sided exchange. You as the healthcare professional should not be doing all of the talking. You should be actively engaging your client or patient that is there with you on what their thoughts are, what, what does their use look like, and what are their goals, what are some things that they would like to do, are they open and ready for change. So if you're looking at it from those areas and that aspect, you're going to have a constant short conversation with the conversation going back and forth between the two and try as much as possible to ask open-ended questions and not closed-ended questions, which will then give you more feedback. For example, and the closed-ended question would be, have you used drugs today? Yes. As opposed to, okay, have you used today? And if so, what was it? What did you use? So that requires that patient or that client to tell you whether they have used or not, and then what it was, which will then trigger the next question that you would be able to ask as you work through this process. If there is a screening result of a high risk, a referral to treatment is then provided. This is a proactive process that facilitates access to specialty care for those requiring more extensive assessment. This is best done as a warm handoff occurring when the, with the patient when possible, or call regarding the referral is made while the patient is still present. This means that this is gonna take place while you still have your client or patient seated there with you. 
If the referral is going to be to another member of your team and they are there, then you can make the call letting them know that you're on your way with Mr. Joe and that you will be walking them to their office. That way, then when you arrive, you can provide an introduction, explain what the next step will be to your patient, and leave them with the assurance that you're still there if they need you throughout this process, because you're typically the one that has established the rapport. If the referral is being made outside of the office, and it's going to require an appointment being scheduled at a later date, then still initiate and make that call while they are there. This helps to encourage possibly more follow through on the patient's end or client's end, and it lets them know that you're going to be actively engaged in this process while they get to the referral source that they need. SBIRT is four easy to use phases, establishing rapport, eliciting thoughts and providing feedback, enhancing motivation, and negotiating a plan. The most important change being fostered by the implementation of SBIRT is a shift in the culture. This happens by encouraging open and honest dialogue, removing the judgment and stigma that is often associated with substance use, treating each client as a whole person, and integrating behavioral health care and referrals into the healthcare setting. Drug prevention programs are designed to provide the education and support to diminish drug dependency in communities, schools, and the workplace. It has become an important first step in providing information about the dangers of addiction, prevention techniques, and where to find recovery help. Drug abuse is a growing problem and prevention should be a priority in all of our homes and communities. Prevention is most effective when it is followed up with continued support. The best way to prevent op opioid overdose deaths are to improve opioid prescribing, reduce exposure to opioids, prevent misuse and treat opioid use disorder, and expand access to and use of Narcan. Improving the way opioids are prescribed can ensure patients have access to safer, more effective pain management and treatment. Reducing exposure to prescription opioids for situations where the risk of opioids outweigh the benefits is a vital part of prevention. Exploring other methods, other treatment methods that can be used. There are many ways to help reduce exposure and prevent misuse such as prescription drug monitoring programs, patient education on safe storage and disposal, and improving outreach and education to enhance awareness. Treating opioid use disorder helps to prevent overdose and even death. It is crucial to expand access to evidence-based treatment, medication assistance treatment, and counseling and behavioral therapy. Expanding access to and use of Narcan by using standing orders at pharmacies, access and use by law enforcement officials and EMS, and incorporating the discussion on how to access and use in substance abuse treatment programs and in other healthcare agencies when encountering clients with opioid use disorder. And not just with clients with opioid use disorders, but engaging in this conversation if you know that your patient or client has a prescription for opioids. Every overdose does not always occur because they are, there's misuse or abuse going on. So anyone with a prescription for an opioid should also have on hand Narcan. Drug use and addiction is a disease that affects your brain and your behavior. Over time, your brain actually changes in certain ways that creates the urge to use. Opioid drugs alter your brain by creating artificial endorphins. Besides blocking pain, these endorphins also make you feel good, and over time, too much can cause you to rely on these artificial endorphins 
and your brain can even stop producing its own endorphins. Other risks of using prescription opioids include dependence and addiction. The risks of these are higher when the medications are misused by either taking too much, taking someone else's, taking it differently than prescribed, or taking it to get high. Every year, millions of Americans use opioids to manage pain. While appropriate in many cases, the high volume of prescribing rates has led to misuse and acquiring the drug illegally after a tolerance and or dependence has developed. Non-medical use is typically characterized by three main sources of opioids, and this is where they typically get them from, family, friends, or personal prescriptions. The dependence on prescription opioids is often the gateway to heroin use. Heroin is an illegal, highly addictive opioid. Heroin use has increased across the U.S. It is used among men and women, most age groups, and all income levels. Some of the greatest increases in use occurred in demographic groups like women, privately insured, and people with higher incomes. Many who use heroin have previously used and are addicted to opioid pain relievers. Studies show that prescription opioid abuse preceded heroin use by an average of two years, and frequent prescription opioid users with dependence or abuse are more likely to switch to heroin. One of the main factors that contributes to the popularity of a drug is availability, and the supply of heroin has been increasing. Studies show that many users cite that heroin is cheaper, more available, and is a better high. 94% reported choosing heroin because prescription opioids were more expensive and harder to obtain. Earlier this year, I attended a symposium for families with the focus on understanding the opioid epidemic. Towards the end, myself and the mobile team were to do a Narcan training. We didn't know going in that the organizers would round out this symposium with family testimonies by two mothers. Each shared their story of their experience with having children with opioid use disorder. I think it's important here to make known that these were mothers of two different races, two different socioeconomic statuses, the children were different genders, and each with a different introduction to opioid use disorder. One after receiving a prescription for pain medication following a dental procedure, and the other after starting to smoke marijuana in high school. For each of the substance use, substance abuse use grew as they became dependent. Eventually, each of their use led to heroin. One, after the accessibility to prescription opioids was no longer easy to get, and the other after being introduced and pressured by a friend that it would be the best feeling in the world, and later admitting that it was the best feeling in the world, and wanting to take it back but couldn't. Both of these mothers shared the story of what life has been like with the ins and outs of rehab, among other things. These testimonies triggered so many thoughts and feelings in me that day, but the two I want to share with you today were, as I was sitting there and all of these thoughts were going through my head, was how important it is that we understand the disease process of addiction and how through prevention measures, we can save lives. As more Americans are abusing prescription medicine and the adverse effects this is causing in communities across the nation, several safe and highly effective disposal options have become available. The next three slides will sh provide information on safe disposal methods offered by Northeast Delta Human Services Authority. Deterra is a proven solution that permanently destroys opioids 
and other prescription and over-the-counter medications. The, th the three-step process is quick, safe, and easy to use. First, you will open the package and place meds in. Next, you will fill with water. And then the last and final step is to close and shake for 30 seconds and then discard. The drug has then been effectively deactivated and can no longer be used to get high. Medication take back options are the best way to safely dispose of most types of unneeded or expired prescription and over the counter medicine. Northeast Delta currently has six drop boxes that have been placed throughout the region at the East Carroll Parish Sheriff's Office, Gramlin Police Department, the Monroe Police Department, Cholula Police Department, Kensal Parish Sheriff's Office, and the ULM Police Department. And we have plans for three additional boxes to be placed soon. Our goal is that we place two boxes each year in new locations in an effort to have one located in each of the 12 parishes serviced by Northeast Delta Human Services Authority. National Take Back Day is held every year in April and October in designated places where unused and expired medications can be dropped off. Since the fall of 2010, there has been nearly 12.7 million pounds collected. Now we get to Narcan. Narcan is an opioid antagonist that can quickly and safely reverse the potentially fatal effects of an opioid overdose. Narcan carries no risk of abuse and has no effects on individuals who do not already, already have opioids in their system. It does not generate physical dependency. Overdose signs are small, constricted pinpoint pupils, falling asleep or loss of consciousness, slow, shallow breathing, choking or gurgling sounds, limp body, and pale, blue, or cold skin. Narcan has three easy steps for you. First, remember it's important to recognize the signs of an overdose and call 911. The next step is to administer Narcan using their three easy steps. First, peel back package and remove device. Second, place and hold the tip of the nozzle in either nostril. And third, press plunger to firmly release dose. The last thing is to lay them on their side to prevent choking and stay with them until emergency workers arrive. And here are some things to remember. Try to keep them awake and breathing. If a second dose is needed, administer it in the alternate nostril than the first and rotate nostrils for each dose that's needed to be given. It is important to note that they may be disoriented when coming around and not realize what's going on. They may not know that they have just come back or been revived from an actual overdose. And this may cause them to be combative or afraid. Frequently, individuals who witness an overdose have been using themselves. They view calling 911 for an overdose victim as risky. EMS is often accompanied by the police. So when facing risk of arrest, bystanders are forced to weigh their own well-being against the well-being of the person that's in crisis. The Good Samaritan law makes clearly that the priority is saving lives and should increase the proportion of cases where paramedics are able to get on the scene in time. And I think for those of us who interact with and provide treatment to those with substance use disorder or misuse, it is important that we educate them on the Good Samaritan law so that they are aware and know that this law exists to protect them, to help us combat and reduce the amount of overdose deaths. And it doesn't matter what the drug is in this instance, whether it's an opioid, 
um, an amphetamine, whatever. I think it is important again and good practice and we should incorporate this law into our education. Dr. Rebecca Gee, former secretary for the Louisiana Department of Health, felt the need to write the standing order for Narcan after review of the data regarding deaths resulting from opioid-related overdoses. This was a way to combat and increase intervention techniques and allow for a statewide standing order that allows pharmacists to dispense Narcan to anyone without a prescription. It is covered by most private insurances, Louisiana Medicaid plans, and is affordable for those who have to cover the expense out of pocket. Narcan can be obtained through Northeast Delta Human Services Authority, and funding is provided through the Louisiana State Op Opioid Response Grant. Additional resources for Narcan are the Narcan prescription aid that was previously mentioned on the slide before and can be downloaded at Narcan.com. The Narcan Now mobile app provides important information in your hands where and when you need it. Northeast Delta HSA mobile app and all social media sites provide you with quick access to services provided keeps you up to date on prevention and outreach activities, and also provides you with a list of our partners and other resources. And I also want to point out that Northeast Delta has Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and also YouTube pages as well. So please subscribe to all in order to keep up with everything that is going on with, through and with Northeast Delta. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority directs and manages the operation of community-based programs to improve the quality of life of people with major mental illnesses, addictive disorders, and developmental disabilities. Our 12 parish area in Northeast Louisiana are Caldwell, East Carroll, Franklin, Jackson, Lincoln, Madison, Tinsaw, Morehouse, Washita, Richland, Union, and West Carroll Parishes. We are devoted to delivering programs and services that encourage people to reach their true human potential. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority operates six mental health and substance abuse clinics throughout the 12 parish service area. The Monroe and Bachelor Clinic are piloting our integrated care program in addition to providing mental health and substance abuse treatment. All of our clinics provide services to individuals regardless of their ability to pay. We are the state's safety net for mental health, substance abuse, and developmental disability services and access to treatment. Northeast Delta operates a 24-7 crisis hotline for mental health and addictive disorders. There is someone answering the call of those in need, regardless of the hour, and able to provide the appropriate interventions and make the necessary referrals for treatment. And the Developmental Disabilities Department also has a crisis helpline to serve you as well. To discuss additional ways the staff here can assist you with any prevention and educational needs offered through our Prevention and Wellness Center, you can reach me at caraetienne at la.gov. That's K-A-R-A dot E-T-I-E-N-N-E -E at la.gov or by calling at 318-362-4617. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority Prevention and Wellness Services are information dissemination on opioid prevention, safe medication and disposal, underage drinking, and bullying. We provide community education through Narcan Education and Generation Rx, and we also have alternative activities for youth. Student ambassadors throughout schools in the 12 parish region, youth summits, and student retreats. 
We provide school-based interventions through evidence-based programs, such as positive action, which helps students identify themselves and understand their self-concept. Life skills teaches students the necessary skills to resist social pressures to smoke, drink, and use drugs. TNT teaches how to resist using tobacco products. Kids Don't Gamble teaches how to clearly define gambling and the types of gambling. Al's Pals, Kids Making Healthy Choices, develop social emotional skills in children three to eight years old, and Buddy Benches, which reinforces kindness and belongingness. We also have health and wellness classes through our integrated health programs at the Monroe and Bastrop Clinics by developing programs that create awareness, motivation, and provide tools that help to adapt and maintain a well-rounded, healthy lifestyle. We provide trauma-informed care through adverse childhood experiences talks, providing training and prevention measures to create safe, stable environments while helping children build social, emotional skills and resilience. And building alcohol and drug-free communities through coalitions. We currently have three coalitions in Northeast Louisiana. Two are operating in Washita Parish in Monroe and West Monroe, and one in Franklin Parish. The goal of the coalitions is to recognize that alcohol, tobacco, and other drug abuse is a serious social and public health issue that when addressed will create a climate of healthiness and community wellness for all of Louisiana. Northeast Delta Human Services Authority community programs are offered through many community partners. We have support services which provides housing, homeless outreach, and drop, job placement provided through Easter Seals, Rays of Sunshine, Goodwill Industries of North Louisiana, and Wellspring. Addiction services which provides inpatient addiction treatment provided through Raver Recovery, Lark Recovery, and rays of sunshine. And we also have outpatient addiction services for gambling and smoking cessation that are based out of the Monroe Behavioral Health Clinic. Prevention and wellness services, which provides evidence-based programs facilitated at schools throughout Northeast Louisiana and are provided through the Children's Coalition, West Carroll Safe and Drug-Free Volunteers Incorporated, Louisiana Center Against Poverty, and Goodwill Industries of North Louisiana Incorporated. Northeast Delta is committed to reducing social determinants of health through our special initiatives. We have behavioral health and primary care integration as a progressive approach to reaching the best outcomes in caring for people with multiple health care needs. Our Opportunity Zone is a strategic initiative designed to help transform fragile South Monroe communities by increasing access to services and promote healthy community behaviors. Our coordinated care for people in crisis aims to catalyze and improve coordinated care for people in crisis who suffer from mental health issues and addictive disorders by engaging law enforcement leadership and hospital systems to address the need for increased psychiatric inpatient hospital care and improve protocols for people in crisis who come in contact with police or other or enter emergency rooms. Our faith-based outreach engages faith-based communities in our efforts because of the contributions we know they can make to help stabilize traditional mental health services by helping clergy leaders better understand their own challenges with the challenges of their congregation. And Operation Golden Year provides increased awareness, support, and services for those 60 and above. Our vision is to enable often overlooked seniors to not just survive, but rather thrive through the golden years of their lives. Now here, we will take a look at Narcan in action. 911, what do you need, please, fire and medical? So I have what? three people that are, apparently they seem to be passed out drunk, not waking up in my parking lot. Like, two of them are on the ground. 11.30 on a Saturday night. 
Deputies are called to help two men and a woman, all unresponsive. Well, when I pulled into the gas station, it's very well lit. You could tell right away that there was something different about this one. Yo, bro, wake up. You're smacking at them, you're screaming, you're shaking stuff around, moving things, and they're not doing anything. In the back of your mind, you're like, well, what is this? What else is going on? At this gas station on Red Bug Lake Road, hey. the normal measures deputies take to wake people up aren't working. Now at this time, we're realizing we have probably an overdose, a triple overdose at that. And I've never responded to one where there's three people and they're laid out completely unresponsive, turning blue, the colors leaving their faces. It's, it's scary. Got green arcade deployment. Since November 2016, each SCSO deputy has carried with them Narcan, a powerful opioid inhibitor sprayed up the nostril that has brought dozens of people who are overdosing back from the brink of dying. Typically, when we administer the Narcan, you get that deep breath. You see the results right away, but that didn't happen this time. All three of them had one dose of Narcan originally. It still wasn't enough. You know, they needed more treatment. Come on, bud. Come on. There you go. Wake up. Wake up. Seminole County fire personnel arrive with more Narcan. Each person ended up needing multiple doses. You see anything else in the car, LT? And now the deputies have custody of this pickup. They have to determine what caused all this. And after these subjects are transported to the hospital, we're still left with the vehicle and that possibly hazardous material that's inside. We don't know what it is or where it is. I was nervous. I will, I will say that. To protect her from coming into contact with this dangerous substance, Deputy Caitlin Henry put on protective gloves and a gas mask. There were two people standing by that could take care of me if something were to happen. And finally, Henry discovers this small baggie. She later asked the female who overdosed what it was. Then I said, can you be candid with me? What did you think you were taking? And her reply was, oh, I thought I was doing cocaine. And she's like, but that's not cocaine. In reality, the drugs the trio were taking here that night were laced with fentanyl, a synthetic opioid that drug dealers use to make their drug supply last longer and more profitable. But it also makes the drugs far more deadly. Sometimes the users, the drug users, don't even know that their drugs have been mixed with this. And this is leading to fatal overdoses at record numbers. This video provided a look at Narcan in action and how it was used to save three lives in that moment. My goal in showing this video at the end of the presentation was not only for you to see in action what I have previously discussed, but to also trigger thoughts while watching and connect many of the things I discussed and how they could be used before, during, and after this response. Is it just to save a life? Does it end once they are revived, treated, and discharged from the hospital? What is your role in this? Your agency's role? What do you have in place that will allow you to be proactive and not just reactive to the opioid crisis? These and so many other questions can be asked from viewing just this two-minute clip. Remember, regardless of our personal opinions on drug use and abuse, we are all agents for change and should remember that each life is of value and connected to someone else's and that the death of opioid-related overdoses have farther reaching effects on so many more people than just those who are battling this disease. Due to COVID-19, the National Take Back Day in April was canceled and the way in which we normally do these trainings have changed. In response to the need for this change, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority will be hosting a Narcan distribution and take back day on Wednesday, July 1st from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. at 2525 Ferran Street, which is located next door to our regional office. We will be following all COVID-19 guidelines and you will not need to exit your car. You'll simply pull up and drop off any medications. And for those of you who have completed this training in its entirety, 
you will be able to pick up Narcan. For those who are watching from the same agency, please coordinate and send only one person to pick up the Narcan. Now I will turn things back over to Alan so that we can proceed with questions and answers. We will now take questions via the Zoom chat feature. If we are unable to address your question today, we will follow up the email as soon as possible. We did have some questions that were submitted privately during the course of this presentation, and many at this point are related around Narcan. So the Narcan discussed, who is eligible to receive this from Northeast Delta Human Services Authority? Uh, and if people listening are in a different location in the state, who should they reach out to? Okay, thank you, Alan. I think I'll start with the end of the question first, in that if you are not in the 12 parish service area of Northeast Delta, you can still contact me via phone or email, and I can connect you with the LGE, which is the local governing, governing entity, for your parish in order for you to get a Narcan. Um, each LGE throughout the state has access to and supplies and does Narcan education and training and distribution. Those who are interested in Narcan in our region, we put priority to those who are serving primary populations, those who are in the criminal justice field, those who are actively working with those who are using our law enforcement agencies, our emergency rooms and our emergency responses. However, we do not limit our distribution to anyone. It's just that we do have a tier and a priority in which we go by. Thank you for that, Kara. Uh, some other Narcan related questions of who should actually have it should it be stored in any certain way? Um, and then there are additional ones around, does it affect pregnancy? How many doses can be given? Should you wait between doses? Lots of nuanced questions around administration and uh, use. Okay, I'm gonna try to remember all parts of that question <laughs> as much as possible. Um, the kits of Narcan that we distribute come in a box and it has two single doses. They can be stored at room temperature between 59 degrees and 77 degrees Fahrenheit. Some limited exposure to extreme heat or cold is okay. Um, let's say if you pick it up from the pharmacy and it's the middle of July and you accidentally leave it in your car overnight and the temperature is higher than 77, that's fine, it doesn't deactivate it um, if it was just that one time. So those are the storage, storage temp um, range. What was another part of the question? Uh, pregnancy, and then who does Northeast Delta suggest um, should actually possess Narcan? Anyone with an opioid, prescription. Anyone who is taking opioids, um, whether they are misusing it or not, or taking it as prescribed, should have Narcan on hand. An overdose can occur in any situation. Um, you can accidentally take too much, get it confused with another medication, or there can be some chemical changes in your body. And it, when we do these presentations live, I have the nurse on our crisis mobile team present and she can answer that even more in depth. So if you have more um, questions beyond deeper than what I can answer, feel free to email me and I will get that over to her and she'll be able to answer that as well. Um, but anyone with an opioid prescription should be taking, uh, should have Narcan on hand. Whether it is anyone who services those with substance use disorders should have Narcan in their agency. 
anyone, even nursing homes, because you have residents there who are prescribed the opioid from time to time or who are routinely on it, should have Narcan on hand. So I can't stress it enough. It's not limited. Narcan is safe to administer to pregnant women. Um, it has no, its only composition is that it reverses the effects of the, opi of the opioid overdose. It releases those opioid inhibitors that are kind of suppressing those um, responses in your brain that is slowing your breathing down. That's all it attacks. That, that is all it is connected to. As many doses that is needed to be given until EMS arrives can be given. It's just important to remember that you should alternate each nostril every time you give a dose. So if you start off and you give the first dose in the right nostril, the next dose should be given in the left nostril. If you have to administer a third dose, you should go back to the right nostril. Do not use the same nostril each time. So Kara, what does anyone listening need to do if they have any interest in any of the Northeast Delta HSA services they've heard about during our presentation? Okay, I provided my email and also the num phone number to the Prevention and Wellness Department. So you can contact me via email or phone. I am the Opioid Use Disorder Manager However, we have a prevention coordinator. We also have a coalition manager on site. So if your question applies to any of those services that do not fall under the program that I manage, then it is a simple, easy way for me to connect you to those that manage the other programs that are provided. So again, you can reach me at kara.etienne at la.gov, K-A-R-A, dot e t i e n n e at l a dot gov or 318-362-4617 extension 1802. Thank you for joining us today. Please visit our website at www dot n E Delta HSA.org and follow us on our various social media handles at N E Delta HSA. Please join us on future presentations of this webinar series by the Prevention and Wellness Team at Northeast Delta HSA. We are here to improve education awareness, advance community discourse and focus on recovery during social distancing and other issues enhanced by COVID-19. Together, we, Northeast Delta Human Services Authority and you, are building stronger communities together, one person at a time.